Hello and welcome to the latest Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. I'm Jonathan Davis, the editor of the Investment Trust Handbook, and your host for this weekly review of all the latest news and developments affecting the investment trust sector. My thanks to JP Morgan Asset Management for agreeing to sponsor the podcast, which as a result will now remain free for the foreseeable future. Moneymakers is an independent research and publishing venture with a mission to explain and inform. But I must remind you that for regulatory reasons, nothing you hear from any speaker today should be regarded as constituting individual investment advice. It was almost like old times in the markets again this week, with bond yields coming down, stock markets pushing well ahead, and central banks talking openly about interest rate cuts. So there's a pretty positive background. And as a result, we saw significant moves in the equity markets, the Japanese market yet again well to the fore. The Nikkei is up around 5.4% this week, followed by the US markets, despite a a small sell-off at the end of the week for both NASDAQ and the S&P 500. But they were still up on the week, S&P 500 up 2.3%, NASDAQ composite index uh, 2.8%. The UK market joined in as well, the FTSE All Share up 2.4%, while the Investment Trust Index managed a more sedate 1.6% gain over the week. That was helped by uh, some narrowing of discounts, the average discount across the sector, now around 15%, a normal response to interest rate movements. Uh, The Chinese market is only being the only significant large market that uh, did not record a gain this week when in fact saw a decline of around 1%. Overall in the markets generally, I should mention that both oil and gold were essentially flat on the week, while the dollar continued its recent showing of strength, no doubt linked to some news about the likely movement of interest rates this year. The Fed now talking openly about the possibility of making three cuts during the course of 2024. Plenty of news from the investment trust sector, some of which I shall be discussing with my guest on the podcast this week, who is Andrew McHattie, the editor of the Investment Trust newsletter. More from him in a moment. Looking in more detail at the Investment Trust Index performance this week, gainers in the index outnumbered losers by getting on for two to one this week. That's why the index itself was up over the week. And again, there were some significant moves on both sides of the ledger, as seems to be quite common these days. Notable that renewable energy trusts in particular were not as strong as other sectors, but there was significant gains from a number of trusts that uh, are worth mentioning perhaps. 3i was up 8% on the week following more positive news about its large retailer holding action. Scottish Mortgage, which recently announced a £1 billion share buyback program, was up 6.7%. That may also have had something to do with the news that Elliott Management, the US hedge fund, which has taken large and uh, activist positions in investment trusts some years ago, notably with Alliance Trust, forcing some changes there, announced that it also has built up a 5% stake in Scottish Mortgage, the Bailey Gifford Managed Trust. And there were some positive moves also in the real estate sector, commercial property moving up some number of names there. Amongst other news also, we heard yet again from uh, Hypnosis Songs, ticker song, where the board now says that the NAV has been persistently overstated in its valuations. That's part of the ongoing battle of wills, if you like, between the investment trust manager and the board. We also heard that Tritax Big Box, ticker BBOX, has agreed the terms of its proposed merger with UK Commercial Property, ticker UKCM, and that deal is expected to be completed in May, assuming shareholders approve all the final resolutions that uh, affect that one. In the commercial property sector, we learned that Urban Logistics, ticker SHED, has decided against going ahead with a formal rival offer for Aberdeen Property Income, ticker API. Uh, which is already the receipt, if you will recall, of an offer from Custodian Property Income REIT, ticker C-R-E-I. And then there was also news, of course, from Home REIT, the troubled property for the homeless business, whose shares have been suspended now for well over a year, where AEW, the managers who've taken on the job are trying to sort out the mess at this particular trust, said that uh, it thought it was around halfway through the process of resolving the many issues surrounding that one. 
And we also learnt that uh, the Serious Fraud Office is now investigating whether there was fraud committed at the earlier stages of this particular investment trust's life. That's not a great story. We're not going to be focusing on that one this week. But for the rest, we are entering the ISA season, as we'll be discussing again in a moment. And the end of the first quarter, we're at least finishing on a positive note. We'll be interested to see whether or not, as the year unfolds, this is an election year, as has been pointed out by many, with important elections in many countries, uh, likely, including the US and the UK. Uh, whether or not we shall see what is the normal pattern whereby markets are generally weaker during the mid six months of the year, in other words, the second and third quarters, and stronger in the first and fourth quarters. Will we see that again this year? That remains to be seen. Looking in more detail at some of the results that came out from the investment trust sector, well, we had a number of annual results. There's still a steady stream of those, of which the most notable, I think, would be the performance of Fidelity European, ticker FEV, which reported an NAV total return of 17.5% for the latest 12-month period. That's 2% roughly ahead of its benchmark. And there was good numbers also from the likes of Witten, up 12.7%. Although that was a couple of percentage points behind its benchmark. We'll be talking about that one again in a moment because also news coming out from that trust that the uh, CEO, Andrew Bell, is deciding to retire shortly and the board is undertaking a strategic review of the way that this uh, multi-manager trust is going to be managed in future. More on that again in a moment. And also strong results from uh, Literacy Capital, ticker book BOOK, which reported a NAV total return of 19% for 2023. Also some positive but uh, slightly behind their benchmark results from JP Morgan Cleverhouse. NAV total return 7.2%. Uh, European assets 8.2%. A couple of percentage points behind its benchmark too. And JP Morgan US smaller companies which posted I guess you have to say slightly disappointing a result of 4.6% NAV total return which was some 5% behind its benchmark. And a couple of negative annual results as well. There's a one from LMS Capital. That's the old London and Merchant Securities. NAV total return down 8%. And Symphony International, not a company we follow closely, ticker SIHL, which had a 20.7% NAV total return decline in 2023. And there are also some decent interim results from the likes of Tufton Oceanic Assets, ticker SHIP, the Shipping Leasing Investment Trust. Bailey Gifford Japan, Vietnam Holdings, and PRS REIT. For subscribers to the Money Makers Circle, we have our normal summary of all the main movers over the past week, six months, and year in terms of share price, NAVs, and discount movements. And this week, our profile features Brown Advisory US Smaller Companies, ticker BASC, and that will be followed next week by a profile of rights and issues ticker r i i i the uk smaller companies trust which was uh, taken on by dan nichols at jupiter and formerly at schroeder's and elsewhere following the retirement of its founder and long-serving manager simon knott you won't want to miss those we have 130 profiles now completed and they provide a independent editorial perspective in-depth review of how a trust has performed and what its characteristics and current outlook is. So don't miss those if you can. They come along with our weekly email, which is now published every Friday, containing links to all the main news items of the week and comments from myself and others. As I mentioned earlier, I had a refreshing chance to catch up again with one of my regular guests on the podcast, who is uh, Andrew McHattie, the editor of the Investment Trust newsletter. I must read for all of us who are interested in the sector. The normal format with you, Andrew, is to talk about some of the recent news and see what you think about things and compare notes to some extent. So this week, well, all, all weeks are interesting, but this one has been also uh, of some significance because of the latest interest rate decisions from the central banks, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England. We're coming up to the end of the first quarter. It's been a kind of eventful year, but no clear trends emerging, I would say. But uh, what do you think? How do you make sense of all that's been going on? It's been a lovely, encouraging week in some respects, hasn't it? I think a nice positive macro backdrop for us. We saw UK inflation dropping to 3.4% and the Bank of England holding interest rates for now 
but also Andrew Bailey indicating that we probably are in store for some cuts to come. And in the US, the Federal Reserve indicated that it is still on track for three interest rate cuts this year. So I think that's quite positive, actually. And my sense is that whilst the broader market has been going up a little bit in the UK, uh, still lagging the US, it feels as though the investment trust sector is just being dragged along somewhat reluctantly. And the average discount has remained quite wide. It doesn't seem to be an enormous amount of enthusiasm building. And I've been thinking about this, and I, I think it's perhaps just the nature of the cycle that, of course, stock markets are generally forward looking. And if we're looking forward, actually, it looks very positive indeed. But I think the difficulty that the sector has at the moment is that the news flow is very much backward looking. The news flow that we're reading each day and we're thinking about is all related to the problems that have sprung up over the last couple of years with higher interest rates. And so I think that's created this bit of disconnect and I've been trying to think of a pithy phrase to describe it, Jonathan. I haven't quite come up with one yet, but I think it's a, a widening valley of value opportunity. It's creating this valuation gap, I think, which we can jump into and take advantage of, I hope. So those are good points you make, I think. I guess the important implication of what you've been saying about the kind of macro picture is that it does appear that a lot of people, including the central banks, think that the kind of worst case scenarios we were talking about over a year ago have not materialised. It doesn't mean there aren't still risks out there. Uh, but they haven't yet materialised, and maybe they won't materialise. We had a very mild recession here and so on. But it's a chance, I mean, there's a bit more spring in the step, is essentially what you're saying. But I guess the issue for the investment trust sector is this hasn't yet manifested itself as a lot of buyers coming into the sector. We know there's been this long period of fund outflows, basically from open-ended and investment companies, and as yet there's no sign of that turning. But there are some straws in the wind, I guess one could say. Yes, I think we have to be careful at this time of year of talking too much about green shoots and spring being in the air and that kind of thing. But uh, I think you're exactly right that the outlook really does look much improved. And quite extraordinarily, actually, we've managed to achieve some kind of soft landing for economies globally, which seemed very unlikely a year ago. And so you're quite right that risks always remain and geopolitics can always raise its ugly head at any point. But right now, actually, it does appear that inflation is diminishing and that the path is set clear for interest rates to come down. And that, I think, is a crucial, crucial factor for our sector, because I think the burden of higher interest rates has really cast a very long shadow. Yes, and I guess the issue still remains, though, whether interest rates are going to go down significantly or whether it's just we are entering, a, if you like, a new normal where we've gone back to levels of interest rates and levels of inflation that we used to have before we had this uh, great period of cheap money, which has had a number of consequences, not all of them good. But let's talk then about this news this week and about the investment trust sector in particular. The investment trust index was up 1.6% this week, but there have been some significant moves on both sides of the ledger. Perhaps one of the biggest announcements this week has come from Scottish Mortgage Trust, the largest investment company, if you exclude 3i. They've announced a very big buyback program, and we've heard some other interesting news about them as well. What's your take on this? Is Scottish Mortgage on the way back? Well, this is blockbuster news and highly relevant for a very high proportion of us that have owned Scottish Mortgage over the years and perhaps still do. It is a very important bellwether trust for the sector. And the big news was that it's announced a £1 billion share buyback that it's planning to implement over the next two years. And that's a huge figure. And I think that creates an enormous headline for the trust. It does sound an enormous amount of money. It's actually a smaller percentage of the buyback than one or two other trusts, such as the Pantheon International. But it served its purpose, I think, as a very bold statement of intent. And I think exactly what the market was looking for. And it has already served, actually, to narrow the discount quite considerably. It's come in from about 15% to uh, 8% today. Uh, and that compares actually to its widest level over the last 12 months of 22%. So I think Scottish Mortgage did have an issue to address here. And it's done so already, actually, without starting the buyback. So we'll have to see how that goes. And I think there's always quite a lot of debate about share buybacks and whether those are useful and whether they actually work. 
But I think the important aspect here is that Scottish Mortgages Board has effectively sent the message to shareholders that it cares about the discount and it's prepared to act upon it. And I think this is quite a significant change. In some ways, for me, it's a measure of how far Scottish Mortgage Trust has fallen. Because I recall going to Bailey Gifford's offices a few years ago and asking about the possibility of share buybacks. And they were dismissed summarily. I mean, there was really no question of that because the answer was, well, we can achieve far greater returns from investing in growth shares. So why would we do that? We need to put our capital to work where it can produce the greatest returns. And I think now there's been a change of heart and the board certainly, if not the managers, has decided that share buybacks do need to form a part of the overall package here. So it's been helpful for the shares. And actually, uh, this morning, there was more news that the activist investor, Elliott Investment Management, who was pretty active in the last cycle, actually, they have come back into the sector and taken a 5% stake in Scottish mortgage. So I think that, again, speaks to the previous undervaluation, anyway, of the shares, and that I think Scottish mortgage could be entering a new phase here. Yes, I think that's very interesting and very important, as you say, because it is uh, widely followed and may give a signal. I think one of the signals may be that if you're going to do a buyback policy and you can afford to do it, in other words, you've got the, the space in your balance sheet and so on to do it, there's a lot to be said for going for quite a big blunderbuss, if you like, because sometimes in itself that will be enough to change sentiment towards the stock as a statement of intent, as you said. And the news about Elliot is also, of course, interesting Perhaps another signal from the board here is that after the rumpus they had last year in the boardroom, when we had a resignation from uh, one of the non-execs, and the general accusation was, well, the board's been a bit sleepy, has been a bit too close to the manager and so on. This is, as you say, a statement that actually they are very much now focused on the shareholders' interest as well. So I think that's all positive. In terms of the actual trust itself and its holdings, obviously, there's been a lot of concern about their private holdings and whether they're correctly valued or not. And they've done a lot of work to try and address that issue, I think. Do you think we could see this uh, Scottish mortgage going back to par? Is that actually a feasible thought at this point? Well, it's a good question. And uh, it's a difficult one to answer without getting egg on your face when you're proved completely wrong, of course. But I think it is a possibility, yes. I think if you have a longer term perspective here, you can remember when Scottish Mortgage Trust was an absolutely key holding for almost everybody investing in the sector that you had to have it. And of course, it has fallen in status, I think, partly because of the performance of its private holdings. Uh, and those private holdings tend, of course, to be a lag during a period when interest rates are rising. But they can act in the opposite way when interest rates are falling. And you can find, actually, that private holdings are upgraded by more than the public holdings. And it could be that this 26% exposure to private companies, which is currently thought of as a rather negative factor for the trust, that could indeed turn around very quickly and become a positive. So yes, I think without getting overexcited about what's happened in the last week, this might prove to be a turning point for the trust. I, mean, I guess in that context, if obviously they have a, a lot of significant stakes in a number of unicorns and, and other large pre-IPO companies, I mean, it would be very helpful if one of those companies was to come to the market. Uh, we've been a bit of a dearth of new issues recently. But if one of those companies was to come to market and to validate the kind of valuation they've been carrying, that would have another symbolic uh, effect, I would imagine. So that's Scottish Mortgage. Good news to hear from them. Let's talk about another kind of large trust. Uh, that's uh, Witten where perhaps the news has not been quite so encouraging from there. But there has been some significant news for anyone who's an investor in Witten, which is another global trust. What's the news here, Andrew, and what do you make of it? So Witten is a global investment trust that is a multi-manager trust. And it was the first trust to engage this kind of strategy back in 2004, at which point there was quite a lot of scepticism about it. But actually, it's played out OK over the years, and Alliance Trust has now, of course, taken this multi-manager approach and actually of late has been doing it rather better than, than Witten. I think the track record is not brilliant here. It's been OK. And I think if you're treating Witten as a long term savings plan, which is, I think, how many of its shareholders would consider it, then it's been a reasonable trust to own. But it hasn't been fantastic. Fantastic. 
And this week there was a trigger for the board to have a think about that when the CEO, Andrew Bell, decided to announce his retirement. And that has been a trigger for the board to review the management arrangements. Now, that's sector talk for let's put the mandate up for grabs and see who'd like to bid for this. And I think there could be a pretty big scramble for this because it's a nice mandate to have. It's £1.7 billion of assets. So it's quite a big trust, this one. And, well, we'll have to see, you know, which management groups are prepared to bid for that on what terms. I think there's been a little bit of speculation that Alliance Trust could instigate a mega merger here. And there's some reason for that, because, of course, Alliance Trust is managed by Willis Towers Watson, and they are, in fact, a consultant already to to Witan. And so there's already a link there. And in terms of the similarity of strategy, that's the most obvious tie up. And perhaps JP Morgan Global Growth and Income, which has been quite acquisitive, might throw its hat into the ring as well, although I think that's not quite such a close fit with the portfolio. It could be, of course, that Witan decide to carry on exactly as they are, as a self-managed investment trust, and that Andrew Bell is replaced as CEO and they carry on as they are. But it's going to be an interesting period for Witan, and we'll have to wait and see exactly what happens there. I had a quick look at the numbers on Witten, and uh, according to numbers I've seen, you look at the sort of 10-year annualised return, it's uh, about 8%, and over 20 years, it's about 9%, in a period when inflation has been more or less about 25 on average, that sort of thing. So it's done a credible job, but um, you probably could have done just as well if you had an index fund, to be honest. And more recently, it's been a little bit disappointing, I think, as you say. Uh, it is interesting, though, because it, part of its mandate is it has a sort of minority uh, holding in a number of investment trusts, which is a kind of legacy of its earlier days, I think. And it looks a little bit odd, sort of a mixture of multi-manager and investment trusts. It's always looked a little bit odd to me. Uh, the idea, I think, being that the investment trust should add a little bit more value over time if they're well chosen. But the performance there hasn't been that particularly uh, good, I don't think. No, you're right. It is a slightly uncomfortable mix. And I suppose it does leave the trust open to the allegation that this is more down to the enthusiasm of the managers rather than any underlying strategic reason. Their argument is that actually, if you're building a multi-manager portfolio, it's quite difficult to build in the very specific exposure you can get to uh, unusual sectors. So if you want a little bit of healthcare or a little bit of real estate or a little bit of renewables, that's quite difficult to build into a multi-asset manager fund with a limited number of managers. Whereas if you have a small investment trust portfolio as part of the package, then you can choose those and add in those elements. So that's the argument. But I'm not sure it's been that beneficial for Witan over the years. Right. So that's an interesting one. We'll have to watch developments there. As you say, um, strategic review, all sorts of outcomes are possible. But I guess one could also compare, as you say, with Alliance and uh, there the multi-manager approach, which is a different multi-manager approach. They're just taking best ideas from the managers they choose rather than having them allocate to different managers to do what they want to do with that. That would be an interesting tie-up if that happens. They just happen to have done a little bit better recently than Witten. Let's move on then and talk about another trust which has been in the news this week. That would be for a different reason though, and that would be uh, JP Morgan American Jam, as we know it. But what's been the news here? There's also personnel involved here. Yes, I think the North American sector is curiously underrepresented in the investment trust realm, but JP Morgan American has been a good core choice, I think, for many investors for quite a long time. And it's been a good trust, actually. It has a good recent track record. It has its portfolio split into two parts, a growth segment and a value segment, effectively with two separate managers who each pick their best ideas from those sectors. And the idea is that it's a style neutral portfolio and it's worked well, actually. But there has been some change here. And earlier this year, the long-term experienced growth manager retired, that was Tim Parton. And that was okay because the trust had a succession plan in place and they uh, managed to convince investors that they were going to carry on without any difficulties. However, the other experienced manager, the value manager, Jonathan Simon, has also now announced that he's going to retire next year in 2025. 
And this, again, is plenty of notice. And uh, JP Morgan, of course, is a tremendously well-resourced manager. So there's no doubt, actually, that they'll put a good succession plan in place. The only question mark I think that it does pose is whether, in fact, the shares do get derated if the trust happens to run into a difficult period and then investors are looking for some reason for that and they alight on the change in management. So there's always some risk involved when managers change, even though, of course, retirement is part of the natural order of things and and happens periodically. Yeah, it's fair to say, I think that the performance of this trust has been, as you say, pretty good. And well, I guess this just puts the focus on how much value do you put on experience and how much value do you put on other factors when it comes to managers. I'm rather old fashioned. I like to see uh, experienced hand at the tiller. I like to see someone who's been through the market cycles and knows that things can get worse as well as better. But do you think that's generally the case as far as managers of investment trusts are concerned? I mean, there is a kind of premium on experience, I think. Is that not normally accorded by the market, at least in the short term? I think that's true. And actually, I think continuity as well, because, of course, if you're looking at track records, as we all do, it's only really meaningful if that's a track record under the same manager. And where you've had a shift in personnel, it's not necessarily relevant to look at the five year track record or the longer term record, because, of course, it's someone different. But that said, JP Morgan are not replacing these experienced managers with school leavers. They're putting other experienced managers in place And so I think it's also easy to overstate the impact of one individual, actually, when it's a a very well embedded process. And that's the element, I think, that is providing continuity here, that the same process will be followed by the replacement managers who've been working alongside these experienced managers actually for quite some time. So my feeling is that when a succession plan is in place, it tends to work quite well, actually. But it's interesting, isn't it? I, I, like you, Jonathan, have a natural inclination to prefer the older heads, but um, I'm not sure statistically whether that has any basis. Indeed. Well, that's something maybe someone will contact us and let us know that. I don't know if it's ever been tested to death. You say the performance has been good. It has actually been terrifically good. I think over 10 years, the annualised total return is about 16%, which is actually ahead of the S&P 500, which is some going, since we all know the S&P 500 is, is a hell of a difficult benchmark to beat. So that's an interesting development there. Let's talk next about the proposed merger of two uh, Henderson European trusts that came out last week. But um, what are your thoughts about that one, Andrew? Yes, it's a part of the continuing process, I think, of consolidation in the sector. And this time it's Henderson Euro Trust merging with Henderson European Focus Trust. I think this is slightly unexciting news. It's just part of the general shift in the sector. In this case, Henderson Eurotrust is the slightly bigger beneficiary of this proposed merger because that's the trust that's effectively being taken over here. But there's only a 5% exit opportunity actually for shareholders in each trust. So there's not really too much to be gained in the short term. And in the long term, it probably does make sense for these two trusts to get together and form a larger trust just to make sure that the capitalisation is suitable for future liquidity for these large wealth managers to buy. Again, it's been partly triggered here by retirement that uh, John Bennett, the long serving manager of Henderson European Focus Trust, is retiring. And that's just provided the reason, I think, to do this, this merger now. But it's still going to be managed by the Janus Henderson European team. And I don't think there's too much more to say about it. You know, I think it's fine. I'm I'm not excited by it, but it does make sense, I think. So it's going to create something I think they might have around 750 million when they put the two together, which is significant. And they're both about, well, not exactly the same size, but of the same sort of order of magnitude. So that will make them, I think, the second largest trust in the European sector, which for what it's worth is something. Anyway, it will certainly be a larger, more liquid vehicle. Let's talk about some other trusts which have been having eventful times, shall we say. And one of those is <laughs> DGI9 infrastructure. Digital infrastructure was a very kind of interesting idea when it came to the market. But this one, I think, has been forced to throw in the towel, effectively. It's not quite clear yet how that's going to all pan out for the shareholders who remain in that trust. What's your take on that one? This has been a quite miserable story for quite some time. And each time we talk about Digital 9 infrastructure, it's to throw a new problem into the mix. But this time, it's actually good news that the trust has completed the sale of its Vern Global holding, which was its largest holding by far. 
and the proceeds now can be applied to reducing its revolving credit facility, so its debt, which is really important because that was essentially the problem here. And it can then press on with the sale of most of its remaining assets. There is one which I think it's holding on to for a while because it feels that this isn't the right moment to sell it. That's uh, Arkiva. But generally now, Digi9 is going to get on and try and sell the rest of its portfolio. But this was a big hurdle for the trust, and it had quite a lot of difficulties in uh, pushing this sale through. So it's good news in the short term. And now we have to see what kind of price it can achieve for its remaining assets. But it's not an easy thing to sell a portfolio, and it does take time. So I think shareholders are going to need to exhibit quite a lot more patience here. And it could be that quite a lot of value will be released, because certainly compared to the quoted asset value, the shares here do look as if they're pretty much rock bottom at the moment. Yes, I think it has the distinction of having the largest discount, at least of the trust that I look at, something getting mm-hmm. on towards between 75 and 80%, depending if you, you know, what number you take as the NAV. I think it was interesting, one other point about that, which is that perhaps this is something that people also ought to think about a little bit. The AIC had a conference this week. Uh, it was interesting that this point came up, which is that it's all very well to take action to do buybacks or to wind up a trust or whatever it is. But actually, it can take quite a long time, first of all, before you get the rewards of that decision. And there can be some cost to it as well, in the sense that if you are a forced seller or you're a known seller of an asset, you may not get as good a price as you would do if you were just continuing in business. And I think that's a factor that obviously has to be taken into account. It's not quite as simple as just saying, okay, we've decided to throw in the towel, it's not working, or the shareholders don't want us to continue. There is a downside to that, isn't there? A number of other cases where, particularly in some of these uh, debt trusts, for example, where They've said it could take five years, you know, before they can sell all the assets that are in their portfolio. That is a factor that perhaps is sometimes overlooked, is it not? It's a slow, painful process, I think, and and certainly not easy at all. And it's certainly not easy to extract that full valuation. And you're right, Jonathan, that it's all very well talking about the quoted NAV. But of course, if you are known to be selling these assets and that you have a need to sell these assets within a fairly short time frame, then the chances are that people are not going to offer you a very full price for them. And that is the position. But of course, if the quality of your assets is good enough, then there will be buyers, because we all want to buy good quality assets, and there are buyers out there. And so I think this makes it quite difficult to judge. And to some extent, you have to, I think, accept that it's a speculative position, that we don't know what kind of outcome there's going to be. It could be really good here. And if this trust, Digital9, is able to extract anything like the quoted value, then you're going to have a fantastic outcome for shareholders. But of course, it might not. And that's the risk you're taking. So it's a pretty uncertain prospect. Uh, Talking about uncertain prospects, I think we've come to an agreement that this week we're not going to talk about hypnosis songs because there's been more news coming out of there, which uh, you can read about, obviously, summarised in our weekly email. Suffice it to say that the uncertainty there revolves around the arrangement between the management company and the trust, and there's been a sort of another development in that war of words, if you like, or power struggle, I suppose you would call it. Uh, So we're going to pass over that one, and we're going to talk about something where I think you think there's more light at the end of the tunnel, if you like, and that would be chrysalis which is the early stage growth capital trust, which uh, has had a number of issues over the past two years, including a furore about its uh, performance fee. But you think this one is showing promising signs of life. It's obviously the shares have done quite well recently. What's behind all that? That's right, Jonathan. The trust has just been through a continuation vote where it received 97% of support from shareholders And 99% of shareholders also supported changes to the fee structure, which is quite important in this particular case. And I think this is just a small signal, actually, that maybe Chrysalis has also turned a corner. And um, whilst we're looking for the first cuckoos of spring, I think the growth capital sector is the place to look. This is the sector that was really hammered most harshly by the sharp downturn in values that we had It was really savaged in the market decline. But equally, we've seen some really quite powerful rallies already in this sector. And there are three trusts I really follow in this sector. Chrysalis, where the shares are now around 85 pence, and that's up from a low of 49.5 pence last March. So they're on their way to doubling from that low. The Shehalian Fund, the Bailey Gifford Trust, $1.50 
which is now 83.5 cents compared to a low of 44 cents. So again, that's nearly doubled. And then Seraphim Space Investment Trust, which is now 58.6 pence, which is more than double. It's 26 pence low from July. So there have been some really strong gains already in this sector. And yet these trusts are still trading on significant discounts to their asset values. And I think they could potentially benefit very considerably from this reopening of the IPO market, which we've already touched on. And the relevant point here is that we're not really thinking too much about the UK IPO market, more about the US market. And we have seen actually this week a new IPO there. There was a social media company called Reddit, which um, made its debut on the New York Stock Exchange and went to a very attractive premium. It was a very successful IPO. And there's talk that Chrysalis could benefit really quite considerably from uh, an IPO later this year from Klarna. And if that is the case, and the IPO market does reopen, then these growth capital trusts could really be benefiting quite considerably from that. Yes, I think if you look at the best performers since the sort of rally started in the last week of October or second half of October, the three you've mentioned, Jihali and Seraphim Space and Chrysalis are among the top five performers since then. So as they say on Pointless, well done for anybody who got those at home. A 50% gain in six months is not so bad at all, though they still remain obviously below their uh, original issue price in every case. So more positive signs there. Let's keep hoping so. Another one I think you picked out, Andrew, is SDCL, Energy Efficiency Trust, ticker SEIT. What's your story about that one? The renewable sector, I think, is really interesting, and, and more broadly, the energy efficiency sector, which incorporates most of that. It has been under the cosh because, of course, it's been very susceptible, I think, to the change in interest rates and uh, sensitive to that. And as investors have perhaps reallocated some assets towards gilt, they've taken money out of the renewable sector, which was yielding a little bit more. But now I think the depressed valuations here are offering opportunities if you buy the right ones that don't have any difficulties in their portfolio. And I was very interested to read the update from SDCL Energy Efficiency, which actually contained a number of positive elements. The trust said that its portfolio is performing in line with expectations. There's no issues there, but also that it's making progress with asset sales. And it's doing this partly to reduce its debt and partly as well to validate its net asset value, which is, I think, quite important if there's any scepticism about that. And it says it has a preferred bidder in place for one of its larger assets, and it might sell a couple of others. And furthermore, it's looking for co-investors on its development platforms so that it can continue to benefit from its pipeline without raising new capital. So I think this is all quite positive. It's quite a positive backdrop. And here you're getting a fully cash-covered dividend, which is providing quite an attractive dividend yield. And with falling risk-free rates, the trust has said that this should push up valuations. Interestingly, it has said that it might be too early to increase the valuation for its end of March figure. But it's clearly suggesting, it's foreshadowing, I think, that it's going to do that later in the year. And at the moment, you can buy these shares on a discount of 32.6%, which is still very wide. And so for me, I think this story here is quite emblematic of the situation in the sector, that it's still depressed in valuation terms and investors have not jumped back in. But I think fundamentally, there's quite a lot of good news coming through in this sector. And I think the outlook again should brighten. I think one of the critical points you mentioned there is the importance of dividend cover for a lot of these trusts. If you cannot sustain your dividend, then you're going to get punished. And perhaps some of them have been over distributing a little bit. You can argue about that. But as you say, this one looks very interesting. And it's a, it's quite a sizable trust, isn't it? I think it's still over 650 million or so market cap, which is surprisingly large given it's trading at a discount of 32%, as you say. So that's an interesting one to watch. Before we move on, just a other trust been reporting results this week, and that was uh, Literacy Capital, ticker book B O K, which has a slightly unusual trust which uh, distributes every year some money to literacy charity out of its profitability, out of its earnings. What struck you about these results? It's in the private equity sector, obviously, a rather specialist private equity uh, trust. I like talking about this trust because it's a rare ray of sunshine, actually, in what has been a quite a difficult sector. And I think as well, it's a reminder that not all of the IPOs from the last cycle were duds. 
Actually, you know, this trust floated in June 2021 at 160 pence per share. It's now over 480 pence, so it's trebled in value. It's been a fantastic investment and a wonderful trust, actually. It's managed by Richard and Paul Pindar. It has quite an unusual approach. It's more of a family office approach to private equity, and it's provided very strong results. So in 2023, its NAV was up 19% to just over 500 pence per share. So the shares are trading on a small discount, and it's a much narrower discount than it generally prevails in the private equity sector. So the quality of this trust is recognised by the market. But nevertheless, I think it's quite unusual that this trust really hasn't put a foot wrong since its IPO. And I think that's something to celebrate. Indeed, we should certainly do that in such a difficult market conditions. Let's finish up this week then, Andrew, by talking a little bit about something that's obviously filling all the newspapers this week, as always at this time of year, and that is the end of the ISIS season, in the sense that you've only got a few more days, well, a couple of weeks before you have to put money into your ISA. If you're going to put money into your ISA and you haven't done so already, please note from my view that it's normally much better to put the money in early in the year rather than at the last minute. But, you know, people don't always know how much money they've got to commit. So I think in your latest issue, you've got a list of six uh, trusts that you, you every year you name a few that you think might be worth looking at and putting in your ISA. Would you like to give us a, a flavour of that, perhaps with a couple of names out of that list, Andrew? I think it's a great time of year, this, because we, we are all thinking about our ISAs. And you're quite right, Jonathan, that there are the laggards amongst us who leave it until the last moment to put it in at the end of the year, and the very well organised who put it in at the beginning of the tax year. But either way, you're thinking about it now. And I think there's a very broad range of opportunities available right now. And I try to cover the broad range in my newsletter. But I'm quite happy to talk about a couple of the names that I've selected. One of them is Aberforth Smaller Companies, ASL. And that's a large trust in the UK smaller company sector. It's a value investment trust. It's had a very good track record over a long period of time. I think it's quite reliable in what can be a fairly volatile sector. And the argument there is effectively that you've got several layers of value on offer, that the UK market is cheap because no one's wanted to invest here for a few years, that UK smaller companies are cheaper than the larger companies because that's the point in the economic cycle where the risk is perceived to be much higher. And then you have the discount as well from the investment trust on top. And when I recommended them, it was 12%. I think it may have narrowed very slightly since then. But I think this is a trust you can tuck away and benefit from the very well-established long-term performance of UK smaller companies. We've all seen the long-term chart, which shows smaller companies outperforming the larger ones over the very long run. And my sense with ISAs is that whilst we can all treat them individually and you can trade things in your ISA, For many investors, an ISA investment is something you tuck away and you leave for a period of years. So to my mind, that one is a good choice. And then something else I've recommended more for income investors is BBGI Global Infrastructure. And I think here the argument is that infrastructure has fallen out of favour as interest rates have risen. And again, people have shifted money into gilts instead. But you have the growth in the dividend here, which is very relevant. And actually, this trust has grown its dividend every year since IPO. It's a large, well-established trust that I think exists at the very conservative end of the infrastructure market. It's only investing in availability-based assets, so there's no risk to the performance of those assets. And it's being paid by governments or by government-backed revenues. So I think those should be pretty secure. It has very low debt. And actually, it's due to announce its results next week. It may well reveal that its debt has disappeared entirely, has paid it all back. So this is quite a conservative investment that isn't going to provide huge returns, but does provide a decent yield. I think it's 6.6% at the moment. You're buying these shares on a discount. And historically, the um, return here has been 8.8% per annum since inception which for a low-risk trust, I think, is a decent return. And right now, because the valuation is low, I think you're in with a chance of maybe pumping up those returns a little bit from here on in. Yes, I think it's fair to say that it hasn't traded at a discount until the last couple of years, for at least uh, many years before that. If you go back 10 years, it's always traded at a premium. So 
that was the low interest rate environment, of course. But uh, yeah, very interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much, Andrew. That's uh, two ideas for people to think about. What do you have a view, actually, uh, incidentally, on yourself? It's always interesting when people write about the markets and what they actually do themselves. Do you actually do a lot of rebalancing in your portfolio? Because one of the points about ISAs is it comes around every year and you're basically adding to your existing portfolio. And that's the normal way it's done. So you're actually adding at the margin. What uh, Do you have a formal rebalancing process where every year you sit down and say, well, my goodness, I've done so well out of X that it's now 20% of my portfolio and it used to be 10%? Or do you just do what I think many of us do is you just add stuff at the margin and it kind of works its way through over time? How rigorous are you in that, if I can ask you that very personal question? Well, I'm a slightly obsessive character, so I look at my portfolio a great deal. And it means that actually I'm not looking at it just once a year. I'm definitely not. And so I do tend to top slice holdings and add to others. And I'm shifting it actually quite a lot more than probably many people would. And that suits me because I'm engaged with the market quite vigorously and and hopefully staying on top of the news flow. So I do find actually I rebalance my portfolio and I'm not adding new names that frequently. I have to be quite persuaded to add a new name. I'm more likely, as you rightly say, Jonathan, to add to something I already own. And in fact, from my list of six ISA recommendations this year, I already own three of those and I've owned them for quite some time already. Uh, I am a long term investor. I think that is really what this sector is mainly about. And so I think if you're looking to trade these names, you can do that if you're quite a sharp trader and investor. But that's not my style. And I do prefer to add to things I already own if I can. Just on my final question on that then, just out of interest, do you have a significant weight in the UK equities, directly or indirectly? I mean, it's 3% of the world index, shall we say, so <laughs> it wouldn't be difficult to have more than the global market weighting. But because you're a sterling investor, I imagine like we all are, do you have a higher proportion of sterling-based uh, investments in your magnificent ISA? It is more than 3%, that's for sure. But it's not a deliberately high weighting in the UK I do have a couple of specific UK trusts in there, but more broadly, I take advantage of the the wonderful world of opportunity that the investment trust sector offers. And and it does give you very easy access, of course, to the entire world through a sterling-based London Stock Exchange investment. So I've taken advantage of that. And so I think actually my portfolio is quite diversified and scattered. And certainly I don't have a big concentration in the UK, but it is undoubtedly more than 3%. Well, on that note, I think that brings us to the end of this very helpful conversation again, Andrew, as always. And, you know, memo to everybody, it is coming up to the end of the financial year. So if you haven't done your housekeeping already, you need to be doing it already. And perhaps uh, ISA is part of that process if you haven't done it already. So that was Andrew McHattie, the editor of the Investment Trust newsletter, talking to me about the way the markets are going, what's been happening in the investment trust sector, and some thoughts about ISAs. Thank you for listening. The Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast is independently produced and edited and is listed on all leading podcast channels. You can also sign up at the website money-makers.co to be notified every time a new podcast is available. Please note these podcasts are provided for educational purposes only and nothing you have heard from any of the speakers should be regarded as constituting investment advice. If you want more news, analysis, interviews and other investment trust content, don't forget to look at the Moneymakers Circle, available now for a modest subscription at the website.